going to go ahead and get started with the Planning Commission hearing. And um, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah? Okay. We're in a different location, so um, just it's, it's different. Cozy. Cozy, yeah. Um, and I suspect a lot of the technical capabilities aren't necessarily the same. And so I'm wondering from the staff, do we have a recording of the summary of hearing, the hearing procedures? Or do I need to read that? All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, let's see, in terms of roll call, we have four of my colleagues here, Commissioner Bonilla, Commissioner Griswold, Commissioner Yesney, and myself. Um, and I'm going to go to the summary of the hearing procedures. And I'm just going to read this. Usually we have this recorded in the other venue. Um, so here's the summary of hearing procedures. If you want to address the commission, please fill out a speaker card located at the table near the audiovisual technician. I suspect today it's in the back of the room. Um, and put it in this basket up here. Uh, there are also, yeah. Um, the procedure for this hearing is as follows. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. The chair will call out names on the submitted speaker cards. That's me, I'm the chair. I get to call out the names on the speaker cards um, in the order that they are received. As your name is called, line up in front of the microphone at the front of the chamber right there. Um, and each speaker will have two minutes and um, uh, speakers using a translator will have four minutes, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to set this clock up here to be able to time folks so you can see how you're doing, you can see how close you are to ending um, the two minutes. After public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Um, response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. The public hearing will then be closed and the Planning Commission will take action on the item. The Planning Commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions, and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. <coughs> Excuse me. The Planning Commission's action on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Uh, section 20.120.400 of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protests to the City Council on rezonings and prezonings. The Planning Commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with section 20.100.220 of the Municipal Code. Agendas and a binder of all staff reports have been placed on the table near the door for your convenience. So that is the summary of how things will go tonight. Um, it looks like Mariel has joined us, Commissioner Caballero. Um, and so we will go ahead and move to public comment. This is uh, agenda item number two, and the intent here is for folks to um, comment if they want on anything that is not on the agenda. I do not believe I have any speaker cards um, other than agenda item eight. So unless someone wants to just speak on something that's not agendized, I will go ahead and move on. Um, and there are no items on item number three, deferrals and removals from the calendar. So that brings us to agenda item number four, the consent calendar. So colleagues, anything on the consent calendar? Is there a motion? I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Yesney to move staff recommendation, seconded by Commissioner Caballero. Uh, is there any discussion or questions on the motion? Seeing none, then let's go ahead and vote um, by orally, I think is what we have to do. So let's just go down the line. Aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. So that's the consent calendar. We're moving on to agenda item number five. Um, so 5A, uh, so at this point I will uh, ask staff for a staff report. Thank you, Chair. Alexander Hughes from the Policy and Ordinance team in the Planning Department. Uh, the item before you is a quarterly update for the Title 20 Zoning Code, amending sections <coughs> 20.30.600, table 20-80 for fence regulations, and several sections of the 20.80.1400 outdoor private property special events permit. <coughs> The outdoor events permit went before the AOUC on January 22nd and was voted unanimously in favor of finding the amendments consistent with their comprehensive land use plan. Uh, staff recommends amending the fence regulations table to clear up ambiguity in the corner lot side setback section. Staff recommends amending the outdoor events permit to clarify the term director as the Office of Economic Development increase the accept and denial period and add downtown to the permit criteria. Staff recommends amending the outdoor events permit uh, to allow events on lawful non-residential uses, excluding vacant lots, in residential zoning districts, enforcing a setback of 50 feet from residences for both lawful non-residential and commercial uses. <coughs> Staff also recommends increasing the total number of events in both commercial and industrial districts to five in a four-month window. This concludes the staff report, and staff is available for questions. Great, so uh, are there any questions for staff at this time? I do not have any speaker cards on this item. Um, I have a question, sorry. All right, yeah. go ahead, Commissioner um, Griswold. All right, Let's make sure I'm just um, asking a question about the right um, one. So I had a, a question about why we were differentiating other establishments from the churches and religious assembly for the 50-foot radius? Um, you mean for the legal non-residential or lawful non-residential uses? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we had quite a few um, public outreach uh, comments about the amount of outdoor private property events that could take place in residential areas. Um, and the way it's currently written, they are only allowed at schools and churches. But in order to um, not impact residences, we wanted to put those in areas that are typically uh, like parking lots. Martina Davis, supervising planner, say this in another way. Um, so currently there actually is, the only time events are allowed on residential properties is churches or schools, and there actually is no distance requirement. Um, we considered adding a distance requirement, but in working with our cultural affairs department who does permit these, they, they said that in their experience, they actually are permitting a number of these events with less than a 50 foot requirement as, as of today because it's not there and they tend to be a lot smaller um, when they're related to church and school. They had a concern with having a no setback requirement when we're expanding it beyond churches and schools to kind of other more commercial uses. Um, the concern was the events would like be larger so they wanted us to include a setback but didn't want to include a setback that would then no longer allow events that have been going on for years to be permitted. So that's the reason for the differentiation. It just kind of seemed that there wasn't a lot of data to support. I mean, given the fact that there's never been events at things other than schools and churches to impose a limitation, it seemed like there wasn't anything. Actually, well, yes and no. We are aware of events that have been happening, may or may not be happening legally that, um, that I think have a setback. Or, so we, we've, there, we've been, there are events that have been occurring. And so staff have been aware of them and kind of understanding how that would work. Okay, so the, like there have been some issues if it's too close to residences, well, basically? Want. Yeah, okay. yeah, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, and our Office of Cultural Affairs, uh, the beauty of their permit process is they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one with the applicants and kind of really look at the site specific and work with them on kind of how their event works. 
Um, and so they did feel pretty strongly they wanted uh, something uh, actually, for context, if you're on a commercial property, it's actually 150 feet away from residence is the requirement. So they felt that if we're expanding the residential zone so a little bit more commercial, there should be some requirement, but wanted to keep it a little bit less to facilitate some of these events that may or may not be happening today. That makes sense. Um, another question for you about, this was under section 20.80, 1440, um, the addition of the lawful non-residential uses was there consideration to whether this should be extended to like a mixed use, like where you had a building that had both a residential and a mixed use component, or I, I suppose maybe that would violate the 50 foot um, issue? Yeah, that's a, you know what, that didn't come up. Um, that's a good question. I, I suspect it didn't come up because the mixed use developments tend to not have um, outdoor parking lots that they use for events. Because really what this is for is this is if you look at the, you know, kind of what qualifies this as an event is that they're taking up parking, required parking. And I think it's that we found mixed use developments trying to have parking garages, right, where they're not, they don't have them. So it just didn't come up. So, okay. yeah. All right. But something we will put on the radar as we densify and have more and more mixed use, I think, across the board, we need to really take a look at the, the distance requirements. Thank you. I had a couple questions for you. Um, first of all, I thought the staff report was really good. It helped me understand what the issue was. Um, you know, it's nice to, like, what is the problem we're trying to solve and what are our goals? So I really appreciated the way that things were outlined. Um, and it made me curious, so I just have a couple questions sure. here. Um, so what are examples of events that, that you might foresee falling under this? Um, let's see. One example is in the in Willow Glen and Lincoln Avenue in particular. Um, some of those properties, the parking lots are actually zoned residential. So that would be one thing it facilitates using those parking lots, say behind BevMo for events. Um, the other thing, again, using the Willow Glen example is, and we found this in other business districts, is that business districts tend to have much closer interfaces to residential, hence the recommendation of updating the distance requirement where they're located in business districts. So we, we expect we might see more events, say, on like maybe 13th Street, businesses, so, what, or, like what or type Willow of Glen. Event? What are we talking um, about? We're talking like one day uh, fairs, um, you know, an example, Derby Day that they have. It's a fundraiser event that's outdoors. Um, it's that kind of stuff. Theoretically, you know, church carnivals is another example of events that come under this. The Anytime chalk on the sidewalk <laughs> event. That is in the public right away, so it does not fall under these regulations. But if you wanted to do a chalk on the sidewalk event in a parking lot, yeah, that would be this. Um, so pretty much anything you're using a parking lot for other than kind of a farmer's market would fall under these temporary events. And I... I wouldn't expect you guys to do this kind of analysis, but it does make me curious. Do you have an estimate of like how many sites this might open up? That's a good question. It. Yeah, it's it's really hard to determine the number of sites. Um, it would require a very thorough analysis of distances and you know the number of parcels and stuff. Yeah, it, it's not huge. I mean, we did a sort of you know, quick analysis of it, and, and it was intentionally kept somewhat limited due to um, <coughs> various reasons and kind of some staffing concerns with the permit process. And so um, it's not like wholesale quadruple the number of spaces or anything like that. It should be fairly modest. For example, Shiloh, are you interested in doing a bike event next year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for example, um, one of the analysis that we did for the ALUC looked at the, um, the airport, you know, areas, and we pretty much found maybe two sites mm -hmm. that it would increase in those areas. Now they're, you know, particularly unique. There are likely more in those areas, but we found two. And then my last comment slash question is, you know, again, I, I appreciated the staff report and I appreciated the example of the Rosicrucian Museum. It helps to like make it tangible what we're talking about. Um, and at the same time, it's hard to think in the abstract and then how that's going to get translated and what the implications are going to be ultimately. So I'm wondering if you guys have thought about, um, I mean, I'm supportive of this change, um, um, but it, have you thought about like an evaluation in a year of like, all right, are we seeing that this is, neighbors are getting upset or, you know, or what, are, what are we seeing after a year as a result of this change? Is there some sort of mechanism that we should recommend to just like revisit and look at and do some analysis on how it went? 
Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a great idea. We, we certainly, uh, I think we'll find out very clearly because these, these all do go through our cultural affairs group, which is like two or three people that we work very, very closely with. So if there's issues, we will know. Um, and it's always our plan to check back and continuously improve. Um, I'm not sure what mechanism for a formal thing we would do, but I mean, we would definitely be open for that because it would be interesting to kind of see what this did. Um, and can we go further? Did we go too far? Mm -hmm. You know, that's like maybe the you don't need the 50 foot setback. Yeah, exa forward, exactly. You know? That's exactly. But how what, do you know? Um, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely, given the kind of uh, small staff and really personalized attention that the cultural affair group, group gives on these permits, there's going to be a very good knowledge base of how it's going. Um, they do follow up after the events, they, they're very good about it. So we'll, we are continuously in touch with them about this. <coughs> I ask one more mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this isn't about the um, the events any longer. This is actually about the fence regulations. Ah. Um, and so, I I think I understand what um, what you're trying to do. My question is, um, or maybe comment is that I really don't understand what um, adjacent to a side setback area or the side setback area actually is on a corner lot. I find this very confusing. Um, and so, I, I mean, I was looking at, okay, side setback area not adjacent to a street. Is that the shared property line that would be on the side? And if that's the shared property line, are you saying that your fence would have to be inside the property line? So I guess my question is, what does it mean? And then the second part of that would be, is there a way to maybe make it more clear as to what is actually, what side of the property is meant to be covered by this fence regulation on a corner lot. Okay, so um, the corner lot uh, can be sometimes difficult to distinguish what the side setback area is. Um, it would be the... Um, the longer property yeah, line. Yes, it's, it's the longer property line. Um, this particular uh, section in the side setback area, which we're um, you know suggesting that we add not adjacent to a street, would be the um, the property line adjacent to likely another property, um, and we're just trying to re remove a bit of the ambiguity to. Um, yeah. So the other terminology we use for this is the interior side setback. Yeah. We actually we thought about using that, but we thought that might be more confusing than you know it's either the one, side setback next to the street or the side setback that's not. But we could you know we'd be open to recommendations for changes mm. to clarify that. And I'll just tell you practically speaking, um, we have a diagram. That's what we really hand out to okay. people is our diagram. Um, so nobody actually kind of references the code on this one, but. But um, yeah, we're always open to, to ideas for making it more clear. Um, so then I guess that maybe that did make sense, a side setback area not adjacent to a street. But then I don't understand if your side setback is five feet typically from a building on the side, how you would and why you would require on a corner lot to have your fence five feet from the property line. So it's not that the fence has to be five feet from the property line. It's in, on the side corner lot, for the most part, the side setback is actually 12 and a half feet. Um, it doesn't have to be. It's just that if it is within that 12 and a half feet, the fence is limited to three, uh, five feet or three feet tall. Actually, sorry, if it's within that five feet, we did define it that way. Um, so if you put a fence that's not within that five feet, it can actually go up to seven feet tall. So that was the that was the intention to kind of create a little buffer between the the sidewalk and the um, fence on the side property line. So that where the fence is directly abutting a street, it's not more than three feet tall. But we're talking about the side setback area not adjacent to the street. Isn't that the interior side? Yeah, no, I see. I see. Yeah, so, but, um, <coughs> right. So on the interior side, the maximum height is seven feet tall. On the street side, it's maximum of three feet tall if it's within five feet of the property line and maximum of seven feet tall if it's at least five feet from the property line. So are you, would you, I'm sorry to, uh, this, I know this, like, this is why we have a diagram yeah, at the permit but, center, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but like a, so would you be, would someone be allowed to put a fence on their property line on the interior side? Yes. At, and what height would that be? Seven feet. Okay. So then why, why um, doesn't it just say maximum seven feet in height, period? 
So we have to distinguish between the interior side and the exterior side because the interior side doesn't have that same, the one that's not adjacent to the street doesn't have that same requirement that if it's within five feet of the property line, it's no more than three feet tall. I, I guess what I'm suggesting is for the, um, under the chart. Oh, I see what you're saying, at least know, five feet from the property line. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah I we find should that take that really, out. You're right, yeah. you're right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that we <laughs> will um, definitely, that was, should have been removed. I think with yeah, that. Yeah, cuz that, that is really confusing. I see where yeah, yeah. Now I get why you're okay. confused. <laughs> and I was actually just looking at a corner house and actually looking at these and I could not figure out what was going on. So, um, I'll send you the <laughs> yeah. diagram. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, unless I don't know if anybody wants to make any um, other comments, <laughs> but if I could make a motion to adopt the staff uh, recommendation with the adjustment of I'm just on the fence uh, yes. issue of removing Thank you. Thank you. at least five feet from the property line. Okay, motion by Griswold. Did, did, did you want to say something? I'm fine. I have one quick question. I mean, really quickly. Can we get a second first and then? Second. Mm -hmm. There you go. Second by Thank Commissioner you. Caballero. Look at your AutoCAD. It's just a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only question I have is uh, section six, uh, item two. You state no more than uh, five outdoor private party special events shall occur at the same location within any four month period. Can you explain the, uh, the adjustment from two to five? How you, how you came about that? The increase from three to five? Yeah. Yeah, so we just wanted to increase the total number of events on a property that could occur um, to give people more options. Okay. Uh, for like, you know, placemaking and easy urbanism and those kind of things. Gotcha. Okay. Any other question I have? Again, pretty straightforward. Section six, uh, page five, item C. The director shall issue the permit or deny the application within 45 days of receipt and you initially have 30. What, why more time? I mean, if I'm trying to have a party, I want to know sooner rather than later. Right. right. So. Yeah. So cultural affairs is a fairly small department. That's right. And so it's just more in line with the time that they require to get Got them it. more thoroughly analyzed and through the process. Cool. That, that's, I, I conclude my questions. Thank you. All right. There's a uh, motion on the floor and a second. Is there any further discussion? Would you like to speak to your motion? No. Would the seconder like to speak to no. the second? second? All right. <laughs> then um, we will go down the line and uh, vote with our voice. So, Commissioner Yesney. Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes, and there was a request for the good commissioner in the blue shirt to speak closer to the microphone oh, okay. um, when you are speaking. So um, let's go ahead and move on to the next agenda item, which is 5, uh, 5B. So is there a staff report on this yes. one? Yes, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I'll try to keep this short. Martina Davis, Supervising Planner with the Ordinance and Policy Team. The ordinance before you today is to facilitate permitting of tap rooms and tasting rooms that are associated with specific alcohol manufacturers, either on the same site as the manufacturing facility or as a standalone use. Um, historically, tap and tasting rooms are not distinguished in our code from regular bars and nightclubs and had to go through the same permit processes as a bar or nightclub. So a standalone tasting room that's associated with, say, a brewery, uh, we consider it exactly the same as any old bar and <clears throat> as part of the first phase of the zoning and general plan alignment work that was adopted by council last spring and went to the commission last spring we did recommend and they did approve changing the tap and tasting rooms when on the site of a manufacturer to a special use permit from a conditional use permit um, so that was our first step of distinguishing them and this ordinance takes it a step further um, so to touch on kind of why they're different, uh, they actually do get a completely different permit from the Department of AV Alcoholic Beverages Control that has different allowances and requirements from traditional bars. Um, key differences include that the premises are not age restricted, so people can and often do bring their families, um, and that they are only allowed to sell products that are manufactured by the manufacturer who holds the license unless they operate as a full bona fide public eating establishment. Um, so that means that, for example, I can use this process to open Martina's Beer Barn and sell Bud Light as a tasting room, I don't make Bud Light. Um, if I was a brewer who made beer, I could uh, use this process, so it is restricted. 
Um, so we currently have about a dozen permitted tasting rooms in San Jose. Most of them are located at breweries and there are two um, winery tasting rooms, all of which had received a conditional use permit or a planned development permit in one case. Um, when we looked through the records, we found that the conditional use permits really have not been controversial. Um, the ones we found agenda listings for went through on consent. And they tended to be standardized when it came to issues we looked at, such as noise, parking, outdoor areas, and hours of operation, um, and tended to have standardized conditions. So <clears throat> as such, we, we decided to take it a step further and um, create a new definition for tap or tasting room that's separate from a traditional drinking establishment, and to create an administrative permit process for these uses to locate in San Jose. These tend to be small businesses, and so reducing the permit timeline and cost um, will be especially beneficial to these businesses opening. We've been working with our local alcohol manufacturing community on this ordinance, and you can see we've included a couple um, letters and emails of support. Um, in addition, we have been checking in with our police department to make sure they didn't have any concerns. Uh, we had gotten initially sort of a, sounds okay, we'll get back to you. Um, finally, just today, they got back to us with something a little bit more formal. Um, they shared that they reviewed it with the deputy chief. Um, we didn't get a formal memo, but they sent us something saying the ordinance looks good. They complimented um, whomever put it together for the time and all the issues they looked at. And they did confirm, as we asked them to confirm, whether or not our existing breweries and wineries ha are having calls for service or issues. And they confirmed that they are not. Um, so. For those reasons, we are recommending these changes to our uh, regulations for tap and tasting rooms. And if you are wondering how eliminating parking for downtown ended up, uh, medical offices downtown ended up in this ordinance, it would have actually been in the quarterly update, but we realized that it was going the same hearing and was going to update the same use table as this ordinance. Um, and we couldn't have two ordinances adopting the same table at the same hearing. One would immediately supersede the other. So we moved that to this ordinance. Um, and the reason that we are making, recommending that change is that we've actually heard from a number of medical office <coughs> providers who are looking to <coughs> locate offices downtown who tell us they don't need parking. Um, they said there's ample transit, ample public parking. Um, they are you know, per hindered by our requirement that they have on-site parking downtown when they don't feel they need it. So we wanted to move this change forward quickly um, because it kind of is how we're going to, you know, we spent a lot of effort making downtown a multimodal transit place and it seems to be working with as it comes to this use. So to conclude my report, staff recommends the commission recommend the council adopt the ordinance to amend Title 20 to create a definition for tap and tasting rooms, requiring an administrative permit for tap or tasting room that meets the provisions of Chapter 20.80, um, and to eliminate the parking requirement for medical offices downtown. This concludes staff report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, and again, I don't have any speaker cards on this item. Uh, are there any questions for staff? Commissioner I'll Griswold. Speak up. I'll speak up this time. Um, the only question I've got um, is about the parking requirements for the uh, tap rooms in the downtown area and um, whether you had any thoughts about the letter that was received from Cooley Commercial about considering reducing the parking requirements, especially given that we might not want to have people driving to these establishments and sort of given the commercial neighbor, uh, yeah. nature of downtown. Yeah, so downtown we're actually not recommending uh, any parking. Um, it's outside of downtown we're recommending parking. Um, we did a really careful analysis on this parking ratio because parking was an issue that it was pretty difficult to do parking for these uses because it kind of made up three different uses when it came to parking. Um, we did their retail area as retail. We did their drinking area as drinking establishment, which is a different ratio from their manufacturing, which is a different ratio from storage. So our goal was to kind of look at what's out there and come up with a practical uniform ratio that we think will work for everybody. Um, what we did is we looked at all of our existing permits and we wanted to make sure that they could all have been permitted under this admin permit process. Um, and they all definitely were. Um, and this parking seemed to work based on what's out there and kind of be a little bit more consistent with similar drinking or eating establishments outside mm -hmm. of downtown. Um, so for that re reason, we, we do feel pretty confident that we don't think the parking's gonna be an issue. We think that it's a more generous ratio than it was now that's gonna be a lot, or before, that's gonna be a lot easier to calculate. So um, we anticipate it's gonna be adequate. However, if we find out, you know, it's w still way too high, we, we will come back and change it. All right, with that, is there a motion? Motion that we approve staff's recommendation. 
Is there a second? All right. Motion to approve staff recommendation by Commissioner Bonilla, seconded by Commissioner Yesney. Any further discussion on the motion? I want to give a speech. No, I'm kidding. No. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> we're fine. <laughs> All right. Aye. Then uh, we will vote uh, by voice, starting again with Commissioner Yesney. Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. So moving on then to um, item 8A. And again, I will. Uh, Invite staff to give a staff report. I have a small presentation too. Here we go. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Robert Rivera with the Planning Division. GPT 19003 is a city initiated general plan amendment to add a new land use designation titled Mobile Home Park to the Envision San Jose 2040 general plan. The new land use designation is intended to preserve existing housing stock and to reduce and avoid the displacement of long-term residents. GP19005 and GP19006 are city-initiated general plan amendments to change the existing general plan land use designations to the proposed mobile home park land use designation. Uh, staff would like to present some background information on previous actions taken by the city to enhance protections for mobile home park residents. <coughs> In 2015, in response to the proposed conversion of Winchester Ranch Mobile Home Park, the City Council directed staff to develop a work plan and process for updating or creating new ordinance and policies to protect existing mobile home park residents. This included a temporary moratorium for mobile home park conversions and closures, zoning code changes making City Council initial decision-making body for the consideration of all proposed conversions, Clarifying, the re clarifying revisions to City Council Policy 6-33, conversions of mobile home parks other uses, and general plan text amendments to add enhanced goals, policies, and actions to protect existing mobile home parks in San Jose. Spring 2017, Council directed staff to analyze general plan land use amendments for mobile home parks as a preservation tool. Staff returned winter 2018 with analysis of the proposed general plan land use amendments for mobile home parks and the associated staffing requirements for moving these amendments forward. Staff analysis identified two mobile home parks with high density residential land use designations, West Winds and Mount Springs, uh, that are most at risk of redevelopment. Council directed staff to create a new mobile home park land use designation and apply it to West Winds and Mount Springs mobile home parks. Uh, it's important to note that the city initiated general plan amendments do not directly prohibit park conversions, but strengthen existing protections of mobile home park residents. The implementation of mobile home park land use designation creates an additional land use process for redevelopment. This would be an additional process requiring city council discretion on top of what is already required under council policy 6-33 which guides implementation of mobile home park conversions where city council is also the decision making body. Uh, Mountain Springs and West Winds mobile home parks are the most at risk of conversion because their existing land use designation is an urban residential land use designation, uh, which would support the redevelopment into high density residential uses. Given current development trends, uh, to denser housing, the remaining mobile home parks would require general plan amendment to redevelop to multifamily residential uses. The proposed mobile home park land use designations, as detailed in the staff report, would allow mobile home parks, mobile home parks and incidental uses for mobile home park residents with a density of up to 25 mobile home lots per acre. The proposed density reflects the full range of densities found in all mobile home parks in San Jose. However, any infill development would need to match the density of mobile home lots in existing mobile home parks. Mountain Springs Mobile Home Park is approximately 21.71 gross acre site located on the north side of Hillsdale Avenue, approximately 675 feet east of Narvaez Avenue and is comprised of two parcels. The site includes 144 mobile homes with private roadways, surface parking, and a clubhouse. Mountain Springs Mobile Home Park has a split general plan land use designation of urban residential and residential neighborhood. 
Urban residential allows for medium to high density residential developments and a broad range of commercial uses, while residential neighborhood allows for your typical suburban residential neighborhoods. West Winds Mobile Home Park is an approximately 83.43 gross acre site located on Nicholson Lane, approximately 1,000 feet northeast of North First Street and is comprised of five parcels. The site includes 723 mobile homes with private roadways, surface parking, clubhouses, and park space. West Winds Mobile Home Park has an urban residential land use designation, which allows for medium to high density residential developments and a broad range of commercial uses. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend to City Council to, one, consider the determination of consistency with Envision San Jose 2040 General Plan Final Program EIR, Supplemental EIR to the Envision San Jose General Plan Final Program EIR, and addenda thereto in accordance with CEQA, adopt a resolution approving the General Plan Text Amendment to add a new land use designation titled Mobile Home Park to Chapter 5, Interconnected City of the Envision San Jose 2040 General Plan, Three, adopt a resolution amending Envision San Jose 2040 general plan land use designations from urban residential and residential neighborhood to mobile home park for Mountain Springs Mobile Home Park, and adopt a resolution amending the general plan land use designation from urban residential to mobile home park for West Winds Mobile Home Park. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Before I open it up for a public hearing, is there, uh, are there any questions for staff at this time? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and go to the public. I have a few speaker cards here. I'm going to call up three names so that you guys can queue up. Uh, you'll have two minutes, and I assume that that is going to be tracked on the the big clocky thring screen up here. Um, so starting with Patrick Grimes, Marge Lundberg, and Saul. No last name, just Saul. Commissioners, thank you. My name is Patrick Grimes. I am a resident of West Winds Mobile Home Park and have been for almost 30 years. My family and I moved to West Winds Mobile Home Park because mobile homes are the, were the last available affordable housing in Silicon Valley. Uh, our alternate at that point, if we wanted to own our own home, would be to move outside of the county, and that was unacceptable to our family life. Mobile home parks were the only affordable housing in Silicon Valley 30 years ago. They are one of the few affordable home options that are still available today. California is having a crisis of affordable housing. Uh, and you guys know it all the way from city level all the way up to the California governor. This is a major problem in California. Benjamin Franklin said, a penny saved is a penny earned. Applied to mobile home parks, that means that saving our existing housing stock of affordable housing is just as effective as building more affordable housing. And in fact, this housing already exists and requires no additional city investment. I strongly urge the Planning Commission to recommend this land use designation. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> Marge Lumberg. My name is Marge Lundberg. I've lived at Mountain Springs for 15 years. And I would like to see myself retire there. Uh, I'm 81. <laughs> For another 10 years, maybe. But once a park is designated or the word gets out that a park is going to have a problem with a developer or whatever, guess how much my house is going to be worth? That's the big problem our equity will go down to zero. We urge that the council not just do these two parks, but the whole mobile home park system in San Jose. This will help the developers 
jump through more hoops in order to um, have to develop the land. And we're hoping that the city council will stay on the side of mobile home parks and disallow the developers to develop. Thank you for listening. So next, next up is Saul, followed by uh, Ivan Erdos and Guao Yen. I'm slaughtering that name, I apologize. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Planning Commission and the Project Manager, Rubber Vera, for all the work they've gone through in this recommendation that they're putting forth to the City Council. It's important for everyone to realize that the homeless problem is increasing. As a matter of fact, the last study showed that the, hos the homeless problem has increased by 52 percent. San Jose has just reached the dubious distinction of having the third largest homeless population in the country. Second is Los Angeles and first is New York City. It is important that we all realize that the mobile home parks are a very, very important part of economical use that seniors, retired people, veterans, all deserve to live in a community that is safe and that they have, well, thank you. Ivan Erdos? Yes. Hi, my name is Ivan Erdos. I'm also a resident of, of Monday Springs Mobile Home Park. Uh, we moved into the park five years ago with my wife as a part of our retirement planning process. I, I think it is very important to mention that the senior parks, uh, they need even more protection between the mobile home parks because this is the only way with limited resources to plan your retirement years for a long time. And it is really important to know what is uh, there in place today. It will be in place in, in 10, 15, 20, 25 years as well. So every protection what, what the city council can provide for the, for the mobile home parks, it is really important for us. This is the only way we can plan our retirement uh, sources for for longer time because housing is big part of that uh, that cost and and it is really important to see with the with the rent control which helps a lot it can be controlled in a very strong way thank you so uh Giao Nguyen Win. Oh, okay, great. Uh, followed by Dexter Goody and then Mimi Spreadbury. My name is uh, Richard Win, 83 years old. I have been living 168 Mountain Spring, San Jose. The reason why I be here today to support the rezoning of mobile home park. I strongly to oppose the landowner from selling the land to force us to move because I'm really old. I don't know where do I go. It is so hard to looking for to looking for any place to live in this time. So I urge, I urge the mayor and the city council member to vote to rezone mobile home park, mobile home park to the mobile home park only. Thank you. Thank you. So 
So um, as a general practice, we try to discourage folks from clapping. Um, so please, if you could uh, keep things under wraps, that would be appreciated. We want to make sure that everybody feels welcome. Um, for example, if someone wanted to come up to the microphone and say that they absolutely um, do not want this general plan designation, but they hear you all um, being very supportive, it just makes it kind of an unwelcoming atmosphere for them. So if you could just um, keep your emotions in check, um, that would be great. So next up, De Dexter Goody. Yes, my name is Dexter Goody. First of all, I live in West Winds Mobile Home Park, uh, 504 Hermitage. And I want to thank Robert for the time and the work that he's put in on this. Uh, living in jeopardy, which is what I feel I am, uh, not knowing what's going to happen to my home that I've been in for 13 years now. Uh, I own the home. I pay rent on the space. Um, when I bought my home from Advantage Homes back in 2007, it was built in Southern California, transported up here, and I chose the lot where it's now sitting. I didn't know at that time that I'd be faced with this, this type of anxiety which is what it is, because I don't know what's going to happen. And this is not only right now, but this is every year. Because what I understand is the landowners, if we do actually change this to mobile home parks, which I approve and hope we do, but from what I understand, the landowners can then petition the Planning Commission every year during the year. Then in November, it goes for a vote. And then in December, it goes to City Council. So every year, even though I'm living there in now what's called a mobile home park, designation. I'm also faced with the anxiety of not knowing what's going to happen this year, next year, or 10 years from now. So my home is where I live. I own the, I own the dwelling. I pay the property tax. It is low income housing, which I understand the city has to have a percentage of for their, for their own charter and everything. So I, would, I just want to say that I approve this change and I want to see it voted through. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is Mimi Spreadberry, followed by Vincent Flores, and then Jeff Stanky. And thank you for not clapping. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you very much for the time for public comments. I'm from Orchard City Indivisible in Campbell, and we are very concerned about the housing crisis here in San Jose. And we are very concerned for our friend, Vince Flores, who will be speaking soon about him possibly leaving, uh, losing his home. Uh, a member of my church lost their home in the Win Winchester Park that was mentioned earlier. We are in a great housing crisis right now. Uh, people my age can only afford a home of a, in a mobile home park, so um, we really need to keep this option open to everybody, not just seniors, but it's the only option for many uh, people here in this county nowadays, hard-working people. So please keep that in mind, and please consider designating this park a mobile home park. I know many people that live in them. I know people that rent en suites in mobile home parks as a way to save money, students, etc. We need to do our best to better protect our residents here in San Jose from the housing crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Vincent Flores followed by Jeff Stenke and then Annabelle Gonzalez. Good evening, my name is Vince Flores and I am a resident of West Winds. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's more to this discussion than what is or isn't legal. This is more than what zoning can be assigned or what new restrictions can be applied to prevent or slow down the conversion of this community into yet more high-rise apartments and high-tech buildings. It is also about doing what is right and recognizing what is valuable in a human sense. It is also a social justice issue. It is outrageous that a person or a group of people can remove residents from their homes, destroy a community where children live and are safe to play, a community that is ethnically diverse, where retirees that raised their families can afford to live, and where their children raise their families. Where teachers, janitors, trade people, gardeners, small business owners, and others can afford to live and own homes. This is the catastrophic destruction of a community 
from which many will not be able to recover. It is vital to recognize that this is about more than our community. Continuing down this path will lead to a city where only the wealthy can afford to live and own homes. I was born and raised here in this valley and unlike most of you, I remember when there were orchards and farms and neighborhoods and kids could play on the street and now we've taken paradise and turned it into an unending row of giant housing complexes and high-tech buildings. I ask you to pass this not only for our two mobile homes, but for all of the other mobile Thank homes you so in much. San Jose. All right, next up is Jeff Stenke. And I, I know I'm, I'm not doing a great job pronouncing your name. Um, next after Jeff is Annabelle Gonzalez, followed by Maria St. Clair. Well, yeah, I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but I didn't know what to say. Uh, I've been living there for 28 years. Uh, <coughs> grew up, <coughs> grew, raised a, my son, 19 years old. He's blind, but I can remember all the times we used to walk to the creek, walk around the place, and everywhere you go, like he was, everyone is saying, there's like buildings and stuff structures going up everywhere and just taking over the whole area and it's um very affordable for us to be able to live in this area but there's if we live somewhere else anywhere near here for the price we're like we're paying it's just it's affordable for us to live there and it's i hope you guys i've listened to all the people that spoke tonight because they've said some really good stuff that you know i hope across the message to you guys um it's it'd be sad to see all these people have to find a place to live and not only that but the value of everybody's houses are, are worth nothing you know that we're we're gonna have nothing it's like i didn't i didn't plan this when i moved in but i couldn't anywhere else so i stayed and i stayed and now now all of a sudden we're in this noticing we gotta we gotta leave and we can't even sell our house we can't we can't get anything for it I don't know what to do. So I hope you guys pass the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Annabelle Gonzalez. And if you all could come and line up and be ready, that would be great. So next up is Maria St. Clair and Hui Tran. Good evening. My name is Annabelle Gonzalez. I live at West Winds, uh, uh, Lot 361. I've been there, I lived there for 28 years. Um, when moving there, I, I, I'm not foreseeing that this is going to be happening. And with all the uh, housing crisis right now, this is the most affordable place we can live. Um, I hope that they will pass that, they will keep our mobile home parks. So um, now that we're having, I'm feeling anxious every day because we don't know what's gonna happen when when the owner is trying to to end, end the lease the end the lease so I hope that um the the city will hear us that we can keep our our houses on these uh, mobile home parks thank you thank you Maria St Clair I'm Maria St. Clair. I live at West Winds. Um, I think that anyone involved in the high density residence area in my neighborhood should drive around and actually see the results. The urban village idea of commercial services and residence has not panned out. Our nearest Safeway is close to three miles away and must now serve 10 times as many people. You should see this to try to get, let, let's, let's see. You should try to get a few groceries at our Safeway around 6 p.m. sometime and you can see how impacted our neighborhood has become. To shop using public transportation will require a train ride and a bus ride and an extra two hours in a day. Our community has streets children can walk on, they can ride their bikes, they know their neighbors. Walk around the miles and miles of condo blocks and try to find kids playing. 
The streets are dark because tall condos end at narrow streets facing another block of tall buildings on the other side. We have trees, birds, we can still see the sky. Help us preserve this. Oh, and no one I know can afford one of those condos, not even with two paychecks. Thank you. Next up is Weetron, and then Janet Travis. Uh, good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Hui Tran. I am running to represent District 4 and the San Jose City Council, but I appear tonight as an ally of the Mobile Home West Winds residents and of uh, mobile home residents across the city. It is no secret that we face a housing crisis, and to address this, we obviously must build more housing and we must build density. However, allowing developers to target mobile home parks is not the answer to this. Mobile home park residents tend to be much more vulnerable because they are in the unenviable position of owning the home, but not the land underneath it. Now, the equity and the investment in those homes can disappear in an instant when rumors spark and people talk about shutting down parks. Because what equity can you keep and maintain in a home or in a building when the land underneath it has no security or guarantee at all? I want to bring up the following points for your consideration. Because I am in full support of the land use designation and applying it to West Winds and the Mount Springs. But I urge you to do what the Housing Commission has done and expand it across the city as well. While we need more housing, we actually also need affordable housing. We often hear that the solution to the housing crisis is simply to have more. Our housing crisis is more than a simple analysis of supply versus demand. We have to look at the impact of the housing crisis on the communities that reside in San Jose and have helped been a part of building it. San Jose has built thousands of market rate units. North San Jose is the prime example of that. We have built the 8,000 residential units that we are allowed to with a handful of affordable units in the North San Jose plan. Now, despite giving free reign to market rate developers in this region, the average price of a Class A one-bedroom apartment is still over $2,700 a month. The desired drop in rent has not materialized. We also have a revolving door of residents where a significant number of them move in and out within the span of a few years, meaning that there are units that become available on a regular basis. These are apartments that are available to rent in the city. The reason why these vacancies persist is in part due to the high cost of rent. So I urge you to support the, the land use designation and expand it to across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Janet Travis. And this is the last speak. oh, never mind. Looks like there's another speaker card coming up. Good evening, my name is Janet Travis. And I am one of, I live in Mountain Springs, Mobile Home Park. I've lived there 14 years. I'm one of those who rents a room in my two bedroom mobile home park so that I can afford uh, increasing rent, increasing costs of insurance, increasing costs of everything living in the valley. I have a daughter, son-in-law, and three grandchildren under 10. If I am forced out of the park, uh, then I will have to move elsewhere because I cannot afford to live here. And that means traveling, I'm 76, that means traveling into town to see my grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law, as well as, of course, they'll come visit me sometimes, but they're very busy, they both work. So I, that makes it even more difficult. So I encourage you and implore you, please, uh, designate Mobile Home, Mountain Springs Mobile Home Park and West Winds, and I agree with the others, as protected mobile home parks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Jack Gudgel, and as far as I can tell, this is the last speaker card. So last call for speaker cards. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking. And uh, uh, my wife and I moved into the Mountain Springs uh, 16 years ago. Uh, we took our savings and bought our home, and we've been making payments, uh, rental payments along the way. Uh, we thought we had some equity, the fact that we had bought our mobile home, and uh, uh, we're not sure. My wife passed away uh, six years ago, so my income was cut basically in half with Social Security, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's a struggle the way it is now, but if we had to give up our, if I had to give up uh, my home, which uh, I enjoy and the neighbors, uh, it's been great. Uh, it's gonna be a real, hard situation. Uh, I've given up driving. Uh, I've had help with uh, uh, neighbors and uh, we live near uh, 
public conveyance with the uh, VTA. Uh, and if I had to move, I don't know what would happen. And uh, I had hoped that I would have some equity that I could pass on to my, my uh, daughters. But uh, the value of the home, if it's, uh, uh, it, it goes away. Uh, if a buyer sees that the, the property has a limited life, uh, there's virtually no market for it. So uh, uh, I, I urge you to consider keeping it zoned as a mobile home park. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and uh, ask if staff has anything else to add. No. So I want to go ahead and ask my fellow commissioners if they have any questions. And I hear, see Commissioner Yezny. I see a few hands. So Commissioner Yezny. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a question for staff. In the correspondence that we received, one from the Nicholson family, whatever, uh, they mentioned uh, an option of retaining a high density housing overlay with the mobile home park designation. And I wondered what staff's reaction to that suggestion was. Yes, as part of uh, the outreach to the owners of the mobile home park, we had discussed um, th just the concept of an overlay in addition to the new land use designation uh, that would achieve essentially the same level of protection, um, which is uh, in terms of uh, uh, city council discretionary action uh, through a development agreement. Um, again, that was just discussed as a, as a concept, and what's before you tonight is the the the, land, the new land use designation and simply the application of that designation to the two mobile home parks. I understand that, but what do you think about the concept of the overlay? Is it a good idea, bad idea? Why yeah, I mean, we, we didn't really, <clears throat> it was something we were exploring. We didn't come to sort of a final analysis of sort of like, whether to move forward or that or not. What happened was council gave us direction. Council did not give us direction to do an overlay, frankly. We were sort of exploring that as like, maybe this makes sense. And then we've been given direction to, <clears throat> to bring um, the amendments before you tonight. So we kind of halted work on that. It's something that if, if it would really be up to the council to decide if they want to direct us to explore that further. Is the city also pursuing Uh, let me go back to the Winchester Ranch conversion, which by the time it finally came to us, included a set of protections for the residents that were so good they should probably constitute a template of what the city would expect from the conversion of any affordable housing project, which basically consisted of protection for the residents. Um, I don't personally know of any way the city could mandate that in advance, but is that information widely available and is there some way to bring it into consideration so that any discussion of converting a mobile home park, the developer should assume that something, some similar level of protection would be desired by the city and that the residents have some idea of what they should be asking for. I mean, the, the Winchester scenario took years to get there, and the involvement of a pro bono nonprofit legal organization to assist the residents in negotiating. It would be very sad to think that every single time the residents have to start from scratch to try to get to that level of protection. And I guess I'm wondering, what can we do to put that kind of a system in place so everybody knows that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the general idea behind an overlay, <clears throat> or, 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 or which could actually be additional <clears throat> language in a council policy, or it could be something in the general plan, but to provide more specificity about what the city would be expecting if, if, a prop, if a mobile home park was to convert, with the idea that it would provide more clarity and reassurance of what the city's looking for, both from the um, the residents as well as the property owner. But that, that work, that work was, we worked on that a bit and it was halted because we were given clear direction um, from the council to come back with the original direction that they provided to us. Commissioner Caballero. 
So I have a couple of questions. The first one <clears throat> has to do with the fact that um, Mountain Springs has sort of a split current zoning, and um, one of which is residential and one of which is urban residential, right? So de differences in density and the decision to sort of um, create to, to apply the mobile home park designation to both parcels. Um, and so that's question one. So if you can go ahead and address that first. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so with that one, right, it has a split, split uh, land use designation. We just thought for simplicity, I mean, we're, we're already, um, through the action, be applying the new mobile home park land use designation to half of it. So why not just make the, the uh, park in its entirety um, consistent with the mobile ho new mobile home park land use designation. Um, you know, we we could have left it yes as, as residential neighborhood, um, and it would you know largely a achieve the the same goals. But we thought, um, given you have you know one mobile home park, it just made made sense to apply it to the whole site. So my second question has more to do with why two versus all 59. Um, you know, obviously, so first off, I was somewhat surprised to find out that there were 59 mobile home parks. I have a family member that lives in one of the 59. Um, so I'm very aware of the plight of uh, folks, of, of the uh, availability of mobile home parks um, and the sort of uh, great asset that it is to uh, it's particularly seniors staying in place, um, but uh, you know the urban residential has the higher density, and I think to P Commissioner Yezny's point, maybe um, um, if we could achieve higher density while also maintaining the low income designation and 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 achieve sort of the same sort of um, number of spaces that were available to folks to stay in community but also perhaps live in a higher density and have more housing in general wouldn't that be sort of a, a best of both worlds idea but um, I guess so th so that's one this is a bifurcated question, and I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, but so one question is why why only these two, um, as opposed to all fifty nine? If we're if we're trying to preserve mobile home parks and this uh, and availability of mobile homes um, as a low income option for our residents, whether you are seniors or not, why not do this for all of them? And um, and I, I recognize that these two have some designations that make them more ripe for development, but sort of you know it does. Seem a bit unfair to these two property developers to only uh, identify these two. So what's the reasoning behind that? And then the second part of that question is, is there um, some way that uh, we could, as a planning commission, make recommendations to the city council to say, like, if you were to do a conversion, this would be the set of templates or, or expectations for which a conversion would be an, a, an agreeable way to move forward? And maybe that's a question for council. So those are my two questions. Sure. Well, th to answer your first question, yeah, I mean, I, I think as you mentioned, the, and you, as you know, I think I've read in the, the staff report that these, you know, given these two parks have the urban residential land use designation, it allows for uh, medium to high density, multifamily, residential, and, and where the market is at this time. Um, you know, we found these to be most at risk of, of conversion. The other remaining parks all have low density um, residential neighborhood designations or what, or commercial or industrial land uses. And th those um, would require a, a general plan amendment to do anything above kind of a single family development um, uh, or in the case of commercial, those uh, designated industrial commercial uh, or commercial, it's most likely that the mobile home park use on site now is going to be of, of higher value to than a, than a commercial or industrial project. So they're basically afforded the the um, same level of protection than the uh, that these two parks would be with uh, redesignating them as mobile home park, and then balancing the significant uh, uh, amount of time. Um, in terms of staff resources to go in and redesignate, um, you know, all 56 uh, other parks, or at least an doing the analysis on that um, and outreach, and so that's a kind of a balance of um, uh, staff resources. And we were 
you know, our direction right now from city council is to focus on these two, and um, so we've moved forward in, in that, uh, that direction. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the Planning Commission can make a statement or an additional comment to City Council, so you have that discretion to do that. I just want to clarify, following up with Michelle's further question, and just for folks in the audience, that there, those that are not aware, we actually do have a council, as, as Robert mentioned, a council policy rela related to closure that has a lot of protections and, and clarifies the procedures for that, and that's what was used by the Winchester Mobile Home Park. Um, conversion process that that led to an outcome that in the end I think both parties um, they both parties were relatively happy with the outcome so I just want to make that clear that there is a process already in place what's proposed tonight would add a further discretionary action for council and the thinking behind that from the council from staff and council's perspective is that it would, it would facilitate the type of arrangement that happened at Winchester Park because that park did need a, um, a general plan amendment in addition to uh, rezoning and a site permit, a bunch of entitlements. And if I could follow up on that, and I think that the one concern I had with the Winchester Ranch sort of uh, conversion was the idea that, you know, those, the, the parcels that then would be converted and the residences that would be available to the residents who were losing their mobile home parks would only be low income until those folks were no longer able to live in them. Um, and so at some point, the entire parcel becomes market rate. Right, and so then we are no longer preserving our low income, and so that I think is is at the end of the day the the value. Like, if there is some sort of direction or recommendation that we could make to the city council, my desire would be for us to say we value mobile home parks because they offer a low income uh, option to a variety of types of residents and we want to keep those folks in our community because it's important for the the viability and having a vibrant community right so how do we do that when we do conversions because at this point while those residents are protected that those homes are not protected once those residents are no longer able to live in their homes. And so that, that was my one caveat of, being, of concern with Winchester Ranch. Um, and so then I just have one follow-up question, and it's, it's more of an off-agenda thing not to be talked about here, but someone mentioned the distinction between senior parks and regular mobile home parks, and I was wondering if that list of 59, if we could get a designation of which ones were senior parks versus which ones were just general mobile home parks. And it doesn't need to be, obviously, I don't think that's something you know today, but at some point it would be helpful. No problem. Thank you. Commissioner Griswold. Thanks. A couple, um, a couple questions, comments, also to follow up on Commissioner um, Caballero's points, which I think are um, very good ones. Um, one, one question I had was, what was the reasoning, if, we, if you know, behind the urban residential designation, I thought I read somewhere that it was in 2011 that the portion of the site was designated as urban residential. Was there some reasoning behind that? I think given the density of the mobile home parks on that particular portion of the site, it was designated urban residential. It's also within the Communications Hill specific plan growth area. Um, and so I, you know, I would say also is, uh, while those sites were designated in 2011, certainly times have changed in terms of, of um, or the, the housing crisis and uh, co cost of housing. And um, uh, so, you know, the, it's looked at, it, maybe the, the council's priority has, um, uh, in terms of preserving mobile home parks has come about after designation of those sites as urban residential. Jared, do you know, because um, I think a lot of the designations of the parks are sort of legacy land use designations that envisioned San Jose just carried over what was in 2020. Were these parks, I can't remember, were they essentially designated more or less the same thing under the previous general plan? Yeah, they were designated uh, something similar in the 2020 uh, general plan. So it would have been carried over. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Um, and I guess that sort of... Uh, goes into another question that I had, which was the mobile home park designation allows up to 25 mobile homes per acre, but 
there also was that provision that you mentioned where new infill must match the existing uh, density on the specific site. And just looking to, let's say, the Nicholson and Westwind site, it appears that the density is pretty low. It's actually, uh, by my calculations at Westwind, about seven mobile home units per acre, and at Nicholson, nine dwelling units per acre. Is that the intention that there wouldn't be the ability to, say, add additional mobile home units to densify, like still providing a low income mm -hmm. housing stock, but densifying that particular park or designation to increase the housing stock, maybe more in line with the densities that we'd like to see overall? That, that's correct. Yeah, that was a concern about, you know, with we were trying to capture the range of densities with the 25 uh, mobile home lots uh, per acre uh, throughout, throughout the city, capture that range. But then there was also concern about, um, yeah, adding additional mobile home lots to, to, um, uh, to the mobile home parks that have a lower density and almost like our residential neighborhood land use designation that um, aims to kind of keep um, establish or keep the um, prevailing neighborhood uh, density. Uh, we took a similar approach here. So um, uh, if there were any infill development of mobile home parks, it would uh, be of a similar character to the uh, parks currently. And we think it's unlikely that there would be, in, in the first place, that there would be um, a desire to add additional mobile home lots. Um, most of the sites are pretty built out. It, it would be, I suppose it would be possible, but it, we don't think that's likely, but we wanted to add that um, language in there. Yeah, I mean, look, just looking at the, um, the maps, it didn't seem like there was actually that much room, despite the fact right. that um, it was actually a fairly low density. But yeah. it also seems like that's somewhat disconnected from the ADUs and the junior ADUs then all, and even the presentation that we had about how do we convert our residential neighborhoods into a higher density um, designation while still preserving character. And so to carve out what's pretty um, large swaths of land here for a very low density. I had some concern about mm -hmm. that. Um, um, so that's more of a, a comment. Um, and then I guess another comment or question would be uh, with respect to the process for if there is a, to speak to some of the concerns that were raised from uh, the comments about, you know, each year someone can apply for a general plan amendment. I know this makes it more difficult, but council changes, policies change. Um, was there any consideration put into specifying compensation in Ellis Act or something of that nature? We, I know that it, Ellis Act is more geared towards renters, but mobile home residents have that um, sort of fortunate and unfortunate situation of the equity in their home, which really is not, you know, in no way adequately compensated if it's just an Ellis Act displacement. So would that be an area where we might be able to um, spell out some more protections for our mobile home residents so that it isn't up to um, the ability of law foundations to provide legal assistance and to negotiate basically good provisions? And, and also maybe to speak to the um, Commissioner Caballero's point about not just having that be an agreement between the current residents, but potentially considering if there is a conversion that there is a 55 year um, uh, affordability placed on the new units, at least in the number of the uh, units that are actually gonna be demolished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think within the Policy scope of this work, no, not necessarily. In that we've, you know, we've got this uh, new land use designation we're creating, and then applying it to the the two sites. Um, so that probably falls outside of the scope of, of this particular work. I would say that the 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 extra layer of protection in terms of the council having, you know, again, I think as Michael and Robert mentioned, the city council already is the decision maker on on the, any mobile home park conversion, um, and, and the ordinance lays out uh, what that process is and the, the requirements in terms of um, you know, providing uh, compensation. And um, 
this would add a, an additional layer um, of discretion for the city council. So I think that act alone um, gives a little bit, um, provides more protection and in, in ensuring that uh, the residents are taken care of, similar to uh, the, the Winchester. Um, the outcome there was, you know, I would say, um, I think everyone would agree, largely positive. Um, and that uh, that gives the council that discretion to make sure that um, the residents um, are, are uh, that that any compensation they receive is fair uh, when there's a proposed mobile home park closure. Yeah, I mean the council could, um, it, it, you know, we weren't directed to do that level of work as part of what was before you tonight. But the council could decide that makes sense. We should provide more specific direction about what the council is expecting if a conversion is to be considered. So that, that's really for them to sort of think about and, and give us direction if that's something they want us to pursue and, 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 and add additional sort of criteria to the process. The council policy now uh, is more about the process and less, less about the expectations of what would be achieved specifically at the end regarding affordability or any of that stuff. So um, the, Winchester Mark Winchester Park mobile home process that you know required a general plan and all those other entitlements so the property owner r realized that to get the approval of the council they were going to have to really work with the um, the mobile home park residents to come up with an agreement that all everybody could live with so I mean I think that is a model and that's really for the council to decide if, if they want to direct staff to provide you know more clarity on what would be expected whether it's affordability or whether the residents who could be displaced have the option to live on site at the same rents for the, the remainder of their life or whatever that looks like that would be at the council's discretion. Just uh, one last comment and I'll turn it over to my other commissioners that want to speak. But on the commercial and industrial designations where I guess um, they are potentially lower at risk or at a uh, lower risk of conversion, but um, I also share the same concerns that we're also only applying it to the two mobile home parks that are um, that have the higher density of residential. And I think things can change really quickly, like the what we've seen with Google coming and now a lot more interest in commercial space and office space. And um, and to say that um, mobile home parks with a commercial designation aren't at risk. That might be given where they're located, but um, I would like to personally see a more broader designation applied to all of the mobile home parks. I mean, that's what's there, and the council seems to be pretty clear that they want to protect our mobile home residents, and um, so I would like to see it um, applied to all 50, was it 59? Or 59. It's actually 50. Commissioner Bonilla. No, I echo, uh, echo my colleague's sentiments about uh, all 58 rather than just two. Um, but I think uh, I think mobile homes are interesting, right? Because there's this feeling of it, it's yours. But the landowner knows that it's not yours per se because they own the land. Having said that, though, it is yours. And I think for me, um, I'd like the motion. Uh, if that's okay, uh, that we approve staff's recommendation um, as intellectually stimulating as the conversation is. I, <laughs> I do want to give some level of direction. Uh, and that's really, that's it. That's it, short and sweet tonight. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Oh. <laughs> Commissioner Yesney, you raised your hand. I was so going to say yes. yes. Okay. Seconded by Commissioner Yesney, and I believe Peter, Commissioner Allen is in the queue. Right. Uh, Commissioner Benia beat me to the punch on making the motion, but I would like to add a couple friendly amendments if possible. Um, all of staff's recommendations, one through four, with additional recommendations. One, that the city council give direction to staff to begin the work of analyzing, applying this uh, land use designation to all mobile home parks in San Jose, all 58, 59, however many they may be. Um, if staff needs that direction, then the council needs to give it, and we are here to recommend that to the council, so let's do it. Um, and I really sympathize with staff because it sounds like, again, you have to twist yourselves into pretzels to obey council direction um, when you probably know better. Um, so I'm really sorry about that. 
Uh, the second amendment in addition would be um, to Commissioner Caballero's point and the points raised by other commissioners uh, that the council explore and direct staff to explore um, revising the mobile home conversion ordinance council policy, I forget the number of the council policy, um, to include uh, some standards uh, related to what happened at Winchester Ranch, but if there are any other standards that could be added to the existing policy to make it uh, more specific in terms of the, um, the compensation to residents when these are converted. I know that we did con um, consider this a couple years ago as the commission, where there, were, there was an effort to weaken from some commissioner's perspective the uh, conversion ordinance, and we opposed that, and the council did too, so folly for us, um, but I think we can do better. So if, if the maker of the motion and the seconder would be amenable to those two additional recommendations, the council, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, because you said they were friendly, I accept. <laughs> um, and, and I also want to add, I know Commissioner Caballero had mentioned earlier that you had suggested the idea of saying something to the city council. If you wanted to make a friendly amendment, I'd be more than happy to, to, to again, because it's friendly, <laughs> accept it. Um, no no, no and pressure. Let, and let me to end before yes, you, is the seconder okay with the friendly amendment? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Caballero. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I would just uh, second the sentiments of Com Commissioner um, Allen because he put into uh, action <laughs> what I was trying to, to say, which is that I do think that um, our role as advisory to the council is to make recommendations that at, at the end of the day will sort of keep folks from having this fear that they're going to lose their homes because either through this yearly process or through um, not all of the parks being designated. So I do, I, I completely agree with um, the friendly amendments, the original amendments, um, and all of that, so I appreciate that. But I do think that it is our role as a planning commission to um, sort of push or recommend to the city council um, these um, policies that could perhaps make our housing stock more robust, that could make um, land use designations uh, more concrete, and, and that could really uh, save our affordable housing uh, for all of our residents and, and continue to have San Jose be a vibrant community. So thank you, Commissioner Allen, for putting into action what I was trying to say and, and didn't actually know how to do. So thank you. You very eloquently <laughs> stated your case. It's no problem. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to put myself in it, too. Yes. And then I'll call on you, Commissioner Yesney. Um, I wanted to make a few comments, and fortunately, uh, pretty much all my colleagues have said what I wanted to say. So I plus one to everything that's been said and just want to emphasize um, uh, that it sounds like we're all on the same page in terms of understanding the importance of mobile home parks, under understanding the importance of affordable housing. Um, uh, and so with that, I wanted to say two things. One is um, I'll offer a friendly amendment to the friendly amendments. <laughs> which is in addition to saying, hey, look, City Council, we think that you should be um, putting a little more structure around the policy that says here's what the compensation is going to look like if we allow a conversion to happen. Um, I'm wondering if this body would like to say something a little more specific about that direction, like um, the Winchester example should be used as a template and it's a floor that that kind of compensation package is a floor for us to start with what we're really looking for is for people who are in the unenviable position of potentially losing where they've been living for a long time to be fully made whole especially given and and that's hard to quantify i mean living in one place and having a home and having a community it's hard to put a price on that um, but there is, that is something, you know, it's not just the price of the home, it's the price, of, I mean, meaning the physical structure, it is the price of living in a place and having a community and mm -hmm. that, and losing that. So um, I would want to give the council a little more direction on like, mm -hmm. we're not looking to weaken it at all. Right. We're looking mm -hmm. to make sure that folks are, who are going, probably going to be displaced, and I, I, I say that reluctantly, um, that we need to make sure that we are um, uh, ensuring that folks can stay here and still have some semblance of the quality of life that they had um, when they were living in the place that they were living, knowing at the same time that these mobile home parks 
are also a you know a relatively low density option and we should we need to be using our land a little more efficiently so that would be my direction in terms of the motion maker the friendly amendment maker that we <laughs> add <laughs> we add some you know we want to see it made stronger yeah. it was my intent to say the Winchester entry would be the baseline and then uh, great but study that um, uh, Sorry, and I have another comment, but if you have a, co a comment on a, my comment. I have a friendly <laughs> amendment uh, to the point of. Um, <laughs> Who's our uh, transcriber? Uh, the the yeah, poor right. secretary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what the, the point of being specific, um, I'd also like to see uh, efforts made to preserve the housing stock beyond simply the yes. compensation in the form of long-term restrictions on affordability that need to be incorporated on site in the new development. And I would wholeheartedly support that because I was gonna make the same amendment. Okay. All right, well, sounds like we're all, we're gonna, we're gonna need to summarize it at some point. And I hope that's not me that's gonna summarize it. But um, so I wanted to make one other comment and I know that Commissioner Yesney wanted to add something as well. And that is something that's, it's um, related, but perhaps a little off topic, and that is that the subject of mobile home parks is, um, it, we are in, I believe, we are in the place that we are in because folks view mobile home parks as kind of this unique um, housing type where you own it, you have a mortgage, and you have a rent, and it's more affordable as someone who mentioned. And so we've, carved out this special place for considering stronger anti-displacement and compensation packages for this specific housing product type. Mm. And I think that's wonderful and great and I agree with it. And I also just wanted to use this as an opportunity to highlight that there is something special about a lot of different housing types that tend to be more affordable. Um, in particular, you know, our garden garden style apartments where these are naturally occurring um, affordable housing where there are plenty of people you know that what the staff report says here specifically is that one of the things that makes this special and unique is that mobile home parks provide um, a long term there are many people who have been living there for a long long time mm -hmm. The same can be true. That uniqueness can be ascribed to a lot of other housing situations and, as well. And so I use um, a garden apartment style housing as an example because those are the ones that we on the Planning Commission are gonna be seeing more and more coming before us because they are ripe in a developer's mind for redevelopment. And so we have a naturally occurring affordable housing type where we don't, we are not viewing that housing type as um, currently we are not necessarily viewing it as one that is special in the same way that a mobile home park is and therefore we are not necessarily saying we need to drop everything and come up with some anti-displacement policies and so I just wanted to say um, use this as an opportunity to raise that issue that I think we ought to um, that we're going to be losing these affordable housing um, these naturally occurring affordable housing um, apartments and we need really strong anti-displacement, compensation, whatever you wanna call it, packages. And I understand that the city is, we just released a report on this, and so I hope that the city and the city council is moving forward to do that, but I wanted to use this issue as an opportunity to highlight that, shine a light on it, and really encourage the council to move forward on putting strong anti-displacement policies in place for other types of affordable housing. And. Commissioner Yezny. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the reason I was anxious to speak is I could feel our motion growing out of control and my brain was about to explode. Um, there's at least four or five critical points in the motion and we dumped a lot of verbiage onto this recording which the staff is going to have to sort through to try to summarize our motion. And I thought maybe we should do that now. Do the you want original? To take a crack at that? I wrote it down. <laughs> I wrote it down. You know, I, wrote, I, wrote I had it a quick question before we reiterate it all, so we, maybe we might, might want to change it after my comment, maybe not, just curious. Um, if staff could just remark that I 100% agree with that sentiment. 
as far as I know, the city council and staff is working on Atlas Act, other kind of renter protections, displacement protections for all of our housing stock. Okay, stop right there. Right. Before you say well, I'm trying that, to remove something from our motion, no, not necessarily well, add to but it. But there's a point okay. we need to clarify first. Council policy 6-33, is that it? I'm scared that I remember the closure that. Policy. Um, we don't know what it says. We, the planning commission, staff knows what it says, council sort of knows what it says. Maybe it already says what it is we're trying to say here, or it contains some version of what we want to communicate. So my first question to staff is does 633 require the kinds of mm, protections that Winchester Ranch came up with at the end of their process? That's, yeah, with, so with... Get and keep, the, it, the, keep it brief or we'll go on sure just do, beating yeah, so you up for days. The policy, it, it implements our conversion ordinance, so it, it requires owners, it's, it's just some kind of broad details here, provides a 60-day notice. Uh, owners have to provide a 60-day notice to residents ahead of applying for just a, submitting an application the, to the city the, for yeah, that's park right. conversion, provide residents with the opportunity to purchase the park, um, also provide residents with a comprehensive program of relocation and purchase assistance. Um, and you saw that through the, the Winchester. But it didn't require the provision of comparably priced pro, uh, units on the property. It didn't allow them, to, it allowed them to live on the site until those units were available. None of that is in the policy. Yeah, I think it does talk about um, doing uh, an assessed value of the mobile home at before essentially the announcement goes out that it right. might convert. But that level of specificity that happened at Winchester Ranch where people were given the opportunity to remain on site or had the choice to, to be paid out or all that stuff, that, that level of details is not in the, in the council policy. It's more about the process. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of what I suspected, but I thought we should find that out before we decide what we yeah, want to add that's to that's the condition yeah. of approval. There's been a lot of work done on mobile home in the last five or six years, and I think what we have to remember is we have to work with the legal. There's, there's legal constraints in terms of what the city can do. So there's been a lot of work done since 2015. Um, we have the housing staff here. They've done a lot of work. We have the deputy director here. So. I mean, a lot of what you see in the conversion ordinance and the council policy is because we're kind of constrained in terms of what the city can do. Uh, we can't force the developer to pay a certain price. We cannot force them to allow the residents to continue to live there like Winchester. Um, so we That's create a good. process that they have to go through and ultimately the council has the ultimate say with the general plan amendment. But a lot of what you're asking for, legally, we just can't do. Um, can we? provide better protection in the ordinance and the policy? Yes, but in terms of dictating exactly how it's gonna be done, the answer is no. Thank you, that, that also doesn't surprise me. So what we can ask the council to do is to set up a system where, for one thing, the council can give signals about what would make them want to convert this land use from mobile home park to something else, and I, I think that's what staff was trying to communicate to us, that changing the designation from a mobile home park land use to another land use, council doesn't have to do it. They don't have to make any of those decisions unless they're satisfied that a package of protections that is sufficient to protect the residents is also going to be incorporated into the approval process. So, our recommendations to council wants to encourage them, is to encourage them in uh, that thought process and to place our own, um, I don't know, we don't have an awful lot of weight in this thing, no power here, but to make it clear that that's, as a planning commission, that is also what we're looking for. We're a land use body and part of the land use decision making is that we want them to be sure to get this level of protection. So we need to phrase our, uh, our approval, uh, the conditions of approval that we're adding to it to give the council as much encouragement to do that as possible. Do you have any thoughts on how to do that, Johnny? Um, I mean, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, the motion no, could be as simple clear. as an encouraging council to direct staff to continue to explore ways to uh, protect mobile homes. You know, we can definitely, there's ways we can revise the uh, mobile home closure ordinance and the council policy. There's more we can definitely do, I mean, in terms of process and requirements, but we just can't dictate exactly how much people are going to pay and, and things and like that. We can't that. say they have to do the Winchester Ranch package. Correct. I mean, I view, I'm sorry. I view the uh, the friendlies more as uh, our thoughts, right? Our thoughts to the council, things for them to consider, not necessarily, you know, do this as much as we're thinking about it. So in that sense, I think if there's a way to organize it, I think that's a discussion, sure, I think. But I, I never in any way thought it'd be a, an edict, having worked up on the 18th floor uh, and, and read these edicts, I can tell you. <laughs> never interpreted as a edict, so I, I think that's yeah. really the easiest way to just handle them. I think with, with all the friendly amendments, everything was fine. I think when the discussion right. started getting down to, you know, how much we should pay and this, like that, that I think mean, now sure. you're getting to an area where it's definitely illegal. But I think with all the different four <laughs> well, or five amendments, I, I didn't I speak up because everything word, was fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Johnny, there was the uh, amend friendly amendment to revise council policy to provide more specificity regarding what we provided to mobile home park residents in, in a closure process. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. There was on, on the upper end of well, then there's that goes on. Winchester package should be used as a floor for compensation slash closure package. Is what I wrote, wrote down that part. I don't know if we yeah. can do. I say we do it, and they can do what they want with it. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. 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 I'd say give yeah. them that direction. If they legal. if we yeah. can't do it legally, then yeah. we don't yeah. do that. But we right. do something to make the policy stronger. And, and, and but I want to I want to avoid what Commissioner Griswold said, which is in the case of the Winchester Ranch. We had this nice alignment of forces. You know, had the, the Law Foundation happened to have capacity to stick their nose in and like be a really good champion of this. Can't guarantee that's not going to. You know, Law Foundation may not exist the next time. They may, may not have the funding to do it. Like, we can't rely on a nonprofit to be able to come in right. and really help. And you know, I don't want to diminish. Also, there are folks here in the room who are from Winchester Ranch. Who were active you know it's not often that you have people who have the capacity to be working with the law foundation and to be a good champion of this stuff so there was a little bit of luck involved in winchester that you know and it took a long time and it took a long time so we what we're discussing is a mechanism for ensuring a good outcome like winchester mm -hmm. in the pro in the so future happened. i'm not adding anything to the motion i promise <laughs> um but if the city council is watching, um, something could get suggested then at some point is, even since the city definitely doesn't have the capacity to, how can we do more to support nonprofit and CBOs that do that work, right, and provide at least um, referrals and legal assistance to these residents, right? If we can't mandate anything legally, at least we can give them the opportunity to utilize those services. So that's another recommendation, but not part of the official motion. So fund the Law Foundation. Fund the Law Foundation, <laughs> fund legal aid. <laughs> that's Fun the Fun Teatro on whatever, you know, whatever organization you want to. So our motion was staff recommendation, and then the uh, two initial uh, points that you added to the motion, right. one of them was to look at all 50, however many mobile home parks there are, mm -hmm. for possible application of this land use. Correct. That's the staff work item. And your second item was... The other one was revised council policy to provide more specificity regarding what would be provided to mobile home park residents when the park is closed. And then Shiloh ad added that Winchester package should be used as a floor for compensation slash closure package. So you're just giving, and, and, and then and it goes yes. on. And then, and then it says um, council should also consider requiring including on-site affordable fee restricted housing units when a mobile home park is converted. As part of the, maybe as, as part, part of, of the land use designation, to actually change yeah. mobile home park to include an affordable housing aspect. Or yeah, just more generally, a long-term method to preserve low-income housing stock beyond any agreement to residents. Yes. So, I, I, Thank you. So I think that the uh, the point is is that like so if we're increasing density, so for example, if the existing density is seven mobile home parks that are reasonably affordable per acre, that if we increase density to whatever urban residential is 40. 
-hmm. yeah, to 40, that seven of those would still remain affordable, low income. So like whatever the proportion is of the existing mobile home parks, that that continues to be the proportion that's affordable. Affordable. Because with the Winchester Ranch, to be blunt about it, once the residents die or move, those, (laughs) those, apartments and condos are no longer affordable like that was what I walked away from that meeting understanding is is that it's great for the existing residents and we want to preserve that for all of you and for anyone who's in this situation but it doesn't actually solve our long-term problem of affordability which is that once those once those residents who were afforded that option are no longer living there that now goes to market right and and we and and ultimately we want to af- preserve the affordability of mobile homes, or whatever is yes. on that land in the future. So, are, is, sorry, is there is any clear? important that feature that? that we have not clarified? I think you should ask whoever is taking notes if it's clear. I mean, you got it, Michael. I mean, yeah, I got it. I think that, so. I just wonder. The idea is if there was 20, 20 mobile home park units on a pro and a hypothetical mobile home park they're going to be closed and converted that the new project should include at a minimum 20 units that would be remain affordable in perpetuity yes okay i think they could build 100 more or three more whatever more but those 20 okay that that's our recommendation to council because obviously that's all we can do (laughs) did we get everything rolando it is all here etched in and michael read it out again so we're, we're on it thank you commissioner yesney for the Clarification. <laughs> so, so there's a <laughs> there's a motion and a second. Any further conversation on the motion? Oh, Commissioner Allen, and then. Oh no, I just I just want to say I love Steph. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank Anything, you. No, I Bonilla? think in, in a nutshell, I think uh, this is about to, to to be a large American city. We have to. Uh, always ensure that there's room for everyone and 20 minutes up north we're seeing cities that are being decimated because these types of protections aren't there so I'm proud to stand with you uh, um, in supporting this Uh, I am about property rights but equally I am uh, about something bigger Uh, and that's uh, ensuring that uh, San Jose is a place everyone can call home so happy to stand with you on this vote Yeah, I just want to clarify a few things. We definitely understand the Planning Commission's motion, and we'll definitely memorialize it in our memo to the council. So when the city council approves a multifamily residential project, what happens then is they have to comply with the city's inclusionary housing ordinance, right, which allows them to either pay a fee or to provide certain affordable units on site. So it's not like because it's a mobile home conversion, then we can dictate that they do something different. So we have our inclusionary housing ordinance that apply. Now, we, that's why we did explore this whole overlay process that requires a development agreement, mm-hmm. which in turn then is a negotiated contract that l- allows us to do these things, which we wouldn't be able to do on an ad hoc basis because they're converting a mobile home park. But then that goes back to Commissioner Yezzi's initial question, which is why we didn't, why the staff recommendation isn't to do the and, overlay. And so, I mean, yeah, and I think that that's, yes, yeah, yeah agreed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. But I think that that's, that's right. like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place in that the staff recommendation is to convert, the, to, to, uh, to amend the general plan to have, to convert these to mobile home park designations whereas the overlay would have allowed us to have a negotiated contract. Next slide. All right. Any other questions, comments from my fellow commissioners? (laughs) Commissioner Yezni is asking that we call for a vote. Before we do that, I just want to say thank you to staff. I thought that this um, staff report was nice. I really appreciated that it included the memo that we that came to the Planning Commission months and months ago, so it was nice to have the historic context and be reminded that, oh yeah, this was this big issue. So I appreciated that. Um, With that, we'll go ahead and vote by voice, starting with Commissioner Allen. Aye. 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 All right, motion carries uh, unanimously with uh, Pierluigi. Commissioner Oliverio absent. 
Um, so that is it on that agenda item. Thanks to everybody who came out um, and encourage you all to remain engaged. Good and welfare. Good and welfare. Anything from the city council? Right. This could be like this. Oh, no. Well, there's a report back. Is that not a five star? And if we could, if we could ask the folks in the audience to be a little bit quiet, we still have a meeting to go on. So if you could either be quiet or um, remove yourself from the chambers. <laughs> yeah, and they're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because you don't have a ladder to get in. Go ahead, do it. Okay, you guys are you ready? I haven't eaten dinner yet. Yes, I'm ready. All right. So, city council report back from February 11th. There was a council was considering a conditional use permit for the market proposed, a market at 788 North King Road, the Mayberry Market. This is a permanent determination of public convenience and necessity to allow off sale of alcohol. Um, and the council rec uh, approved that. There also was a general plan amendment and a uh, conforming rezoning and a sp um, special use permit for, uh, yes, for a real, a property at 615 and 623 Stockton Avenue. So you guys should remember this one. This was the proposed hotel at Stockton um, that had a lot of people come out expressing concern with the project. The Planning Commission did recommend council approve the project. That council actually um, unanimously denied the project. Um, I was not there, but from what I understand, Councilmember Davis was really upset with the applicant that, did, that the applicant did not reach out with her to work with her on finding a path forward for the, with the project. Michael, if I may, regarding that unanimous vote, if I'm not mistaken, though, did, did the mayor lay out an alternative by which the property owner can still build something on that site? Yeah, so there is a... Hold, hold on one yeah. sec. Yeah. Excuse me, I want to call attention for the folks in the audience. We still have a meeting going on, so if you have conversations, you could take them outside or pay attention to this very important <laughs> business up here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, but there there is there is a... The, the commercial property, the commercial building that is on, that they own on the corner of Sheely, I think, and um, Stockton is is general planned and zoned for commercial. So they could do a much smaller project on that property. Right. It would actually all go to a director's hearing on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, it would probably be appealed and would come before you guys on appeal. So they could do that, but the mayor pointed that out, but then voted with the majority. But it's like here, right? <laughs> uh, oh wait, there's one, is that it? Yeah, yeah. There's one more. No, those votes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, general plan amendment and a bunch of entitlements for, um, is this McAvoy? It's on West San, 699 West San Carlos? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah the so they voted to approve that. That was a yeah, no, no problem there. Cool. <laughs> All right, thank you. And uh, do I hear a motion for the action minutes from January 29th? Which have been corrected, I understand. Mm -hmm. yes, I'll, I'll move it. I have a question in a second, but if we get a second on that. Okay. Second. Motion, okay. motion and a second by Alan and okay. I just have a question, not necessarily a correction. I'm just curious as far as just standards for taking action minutes. When... An item gets uh, multiple motions made, multiple votes are taken. Um, I understand that the final motion has to be recorded in the minutes, that's appropriate. I'm just curious if, is it standard operating procedure to remove the record of a previous motion and a previous vote? For example, on item 8B, which we just heard about going to council <laughs> and getting, uh, the other night, uh, or last night. Uh, on 8B, the final vote was 4-3 in favor of staff recommendation. There was a previous motion made that failed 3-4 to four to deny staff's recommendation, or to recommend denial of staff's recommendation. Would, that's not reflected here. Would that normally be reflected oh. in the minutes, or is that something that- I'm not that, sure. Do you, it seems do like you when you talk about, It seems when you talk about action, like you want to reflect the full action, because, for example, 
yes, it's implied that the three of us who voted against the final motion you know, approved the previous motion, but there's no record that that motion was made, and it could have been a different vote. It could have been two to five. It could have been f unanimous in favor of the eventual motion because I would I didn't want to you know necessarily. Can we amend the, the minutes to reflect that? That's well, I, don't, I just don't know if it's standard to do it first. It and should, if, that should be in there. We answer. can certainly amend it, I'm sure, yeah. but I don't know if it's standard for staff to not. I, I don't have an answer that. to that actually. Okay. I don't think John. I did, did I, you know, Jared. It doesn't happen very often, I know, so that's, that's why it's pretty I mean, rare. My, so. my, my professional right. opinion <laughs> as chair of the Planning Commission is that any action that is taken should be reflected in the action minutes. I would agree. So. Including um, a motion that fails to pass. Right. That's the whole yeah. point. And I'm not asking just because it was my motion. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it would be standard, good standard practice to include that to reflect exactly what happened at the meeting in case anyone is just reading the minutes. So do you want to make... Um, so yeah, I will make, an, I will make a, a motion to... Um, I'll amend my motion to approve the action minutes with addition of... Uh, information on the action on the uh, initial motion on item 8B. And is the seconder of the motion amenable? Yes. Agreed. All right. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and ask for a vote by voice. Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Uh, anything on item 11C? Seeing none. Anything on 11D? 11E. Actually, okay. actually, I'm sorry, can we go back to D? Can someone, what is the study session on the 26th about? Oh, yeah. Or was it removed from the calendar? Like, there was, an, there was an amendment to the agenda that said something about a study session. I don't know if it was removed or if it was... I don't know, actually. Okay. Because that's the next I'm sorry, meeting. I'm afraid I was not given inf on information on what that would be Because it's our next for. meeting, so it would be good to know if we're uh, supposed to be here at 5, because it's not listed on the calendar. I think, I know that there's a study session coming about... Um, about the, uh, it's a, the charter, charter amendment. amendment. Change the yeah. composition of the planning commission. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that coming, is that finally coming forward? Oh, uh, wow. That was supposed to come on the 20th. Oh, it's a study session, not yeah, a, it's a study policy. session yeah. to okay. get your input on um, the council's recommendation to bring forward a charter amendment to the voters in November to okay. change the composition of the planning commission. Great. Glad it's moving. That's great. Is that on the 26th? Is that the 26th? I think it's not on the agenda right now, but the idea okay. was maybe we'll have it on the 26th, but okay. we're not sure. It might be pushed into March. That's, that's why it's on the our agenda for tonight, but not on the calendar currently. Okay, thank you. All right. Glad to see that's moving forward. Then, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you.